Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again. Let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we pray together the prayer to St. Michael. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we're ready to move into the third step, which would be the third chapter in your book following the introduction. But again, let's take a few steps backwards to review where we have been and where we're going. The, we read, first of all, from Sacred Scripture, as your book says there on the very first page of chapter 3, page 79, we read from 1 Peter, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and sojourners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against the soul. Be free, yet without using freedom as a pretext for evil, but as slaves of God. The first two steps, the last two Saturdays that we were here in winning the war to save ourselves and remember what our goal is, our little postums to become a saint, those first two steps in winning the war involve knowledge. They were the knowledge steps, as our author says. These steps include, first of all, knowledge of God, as well as knowledge of ourself, and of course, knowledge of the enemy. We must know our role in God's plan. We must have a mission, and that mission is that we are at war. The war is not outside of us, the war is within us. Again, remember the words of Jesus when he, when he spoke and taught about, and he says, it's not the things on the outside of the body that defile us, it's that which is within us that defiles, that makes us impure, that makes us unholy. So the war is within us. So in that first, in the, in the last chapter, chapter two last week, we talked about the various weapons that the evil one uses to uh, wage that war within us. But the greatest enemy of all, our, set, our author tells us, is not Satan. It's our own selfish sins, since we were created with free will. And unfortunately, we have the power to choose well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. It's a gift from God, so that can't be unfortunate. But it is a two-edged sword, as we know. It can do a tremendous amount of good, but it also can choose to do harmful wrong as well. So Satan and his arsenal of weapons and his greatest weapon of all is he lies. He tells us all kinds of half-truths. He cons us into believing that such and such thing will be good for me. It will give me pleasure. Actually, they don't use the word pleasure. They like to use, it'll give me happiness. But happiness, by definition, is always something that's long-standing. And we know that the things of this world are never long-standing. There's nothing permanent in this world. Everything is temporary, and everything is fleeting. The only thing that is permanent is God, and that's why we need to hunger and thirst for God. So the next three steps, the remainder of this book, are the action steps. So as the first two steps are knowing, being aware, the next three steps are now let's put something into practice. Let's do something. You know, we're good at knowing things. I know I need to lose weight. I know that I do this too much. I know that I don't do enough of that. We're great at knowing, but we're not great at following through and doing, are we? That's just part of our weak 
human nature. It's, it's lethargic. The brain says, exercise, and every day I fight that because I've committed myself beginning with this Lent, and that's going to happen, and I'm going to push myself. And once Lent is done, it's going to continue. Five days a week, I exercise 30 minutes on my treadmill. I've already lost five pounds just in the, since Lent has started. I'm not bragging, but, but I'm going to tell you, every day my brain is saying, time to exercise. But the rest of me is saying, oh, you know, oh, no. And it's a fight. We know it's a fight. And I'm hoping that once Lent is done, and we'll get to that in a moment here, but I'll be in the habit, and if I don't do it, then my body's going to say, well, I'm missing something, you need to do something, because that's why good habits are good to have, because if we don't do something that's good, our body then rebels also in a nice way. So the next three steps are the action steps, and they kind of work in the reverse mechanism that the devil has used. Because remember from the last class, the methodology of the devil. Number one, he wants to remove God. He removes God from everything, from our society, from our families, from our lives, and he replaces it with, and then and number two is he re introduces the counterfeits, the false gods, and then number three, once we have the counterfeits going in our lives, then we're enslaved by those. It's a form of slavery. So the methodology that we need to use is to use the reverse and to go backwards, okay? Number one, if we're enslaved, then we not, first of all need to free ourselves. Number two, we need to protect and defend that freedom, and that will be the next chapter have a shield. And finally, three, revive our culture by inserting God back into the picture, and that's what he calls have a sword. All right, so we're on page 80. I have a problem. Surprise, 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 right? We all have problems. I'm not talking about the external problems that we face every day. The dishwasher doesn't work. Yeah, that's a problem, but that's probably not going to affect your salvation, is it? Let's hope not. We're talking about ourselves, within ourselves, that we all have a problem and that we need to free ourselves. And this is, and he's being honest with us, this is one of the most difficult steps to accomplish is to free ourselves because we get so used to everything in our lives, and we hold on to them, and we don't want to get rid of them. You know, if television is possessing my life, if I'm enslaved by the television, and it doesn't take a whole lot of television to do that, I'm enslaved to the old shows, I guess, so maybe someday I'm going to have to wean, wean myself off of those as well. I'm not saying you completely get rid of television, no. But you have to recognize that we probably use television a lot more than we should, even in the most neutral way, even in the most innocent shows, you know. It still becomes a crutch for us, or it can become a crutch in our families, you know. What's the cheapest babysitter you can have in your home for your kids? Turn on the television and have them sit in front of it while you get other things done in the house, right? That's a crutch. I'm not saying that's always wrong, but I think a lot of people over-rely upon it. And then if you're not carefully guarding what they're watching on that television, remember you are, every time you turn on that switch of the television, you are letting a complete stranger into your home. So it is a difficult step to accomplish. I, one of Matthew Kelly's books, he makes a bold uh, challenge. He says, unplug your TV put it in the basement for one month. That would be hard to do, wouldn't it? But we do need to take a very difficult look at ourselves. We have to look within ourselves, and we have to be honest with ourselves. The purpose of this step is not to make us feel guilty 
or imply that we're not supposed to have any fun or enjoy life. The purpose of step number three is to encourage us to look within ourselves and to be honest with ourselves, examine closely everything, the things of this world that we can't seem to do without, and then ask ourselves, am I free from this? So the first step to solving any problem is admitting you have a problem, right? You can't go into treatment for alcoholism unless you admit you are an alcoholic. If you're going to be in denial, if you're being forced into the program, chances are it's not, you're not going to succeed in it. So the first step is admitting that you have a problem. Every one of us has weaknesses. We have habits and tendencies that keep us from becoming saints. And it is a lifelong struggle with these things, but we need to recognize what those things are. Page 81, the truth. The truth will set you free. It's the lies of Satan that have enslaved us, his half-truths, his couched language, who cons us into believing it's good for us, but it will be the truth, the truth that sets us free. Jesus declares himself as the truth when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life of this world. And as we're going to see, we can't accomplish this step at all without his help, his absolute help, and he makes it all possible by that, the cross. Jesus died on that cross so that step three is possible for us. Alone we are powerless, but the cross can truly set us free. It is the power of that cross. Now the world around us, as we probably know this is no great secret, the world says that the Catholic Church expects too much from people. Becoming a saint is just not possible in this age. And anybody who tries to live up to the expectations that the church gives us is setting themselves up for a lifetime of failure and guilt. If we buy into this lie, then what are we really doing? We're stripping the power from that cross. We're stripping the power from his cross. You see, Jesus took it all right into the battlefield. And the battlefield is, as, I, as we have been told, is raging within us. It's inside our hearts. And so our task, our challenge, is to conform our hearts to the truth. Towards the bottom of page 81, Jesus tells us, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But then I say to you, Everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is saying that the problem isn't that we commit adultery. That's not the problem. It's a sin, but that's not the problem. It's that we desire to commit adultery. Our hearts, because of the effects of original sin, are disordered. We all seem to want to do well and be good, but it's this change of heart with which we seem to struggle. Now, he uses an analogy here of using political terms, which we hear bantered about so much and has become so divisive in our culture, that of conservative versus liberal. Many people consider themselves conservative. About, surprise, 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 about 50% of the population. And about 50% of them consider themselves liberal. Both sides seem to think it's a black and white line and that they are promoting the good and that the other side, whichever the opposite side is, is always promoting the evil. So as we look at both points of view, though, we do see that there is common ground between them. A person who is described as liberal may say something like, Conservative people are so insensitive toward other people. All they care about is rules and regulations. They're just like the Pharisees. They put the almighty law 
ahead of mankind. They do not understand the principles of forgiveness, mercy, loving one another. All that matters is love. And then we go to the flip side, to the conservatives, and they might say something like this. Those liberals have no respect for the law. They just do what they feel like doing. They try to take advantage of people who work hard and do the right thing. They promote love, but do not understand what love is. So which of those two attitudes is more Christian? Both sides are well-meaning and have traces of the truth there, but both sides have severely missed the mark. They have missed the point of what Jesus is teaching us. It is true that forgiveness and mercy and love of another, that we must have those. But we must also remember that love does involve suffering. That's the gospel. Sometimes helping people means not giving them what they want and allowing them to suffer a little. It is also true that we must respect the law. But we must also realize that the law is not written in stone and that the law cannot save us. It only reveals weakness. It tells us what we need to do. But it's not written in stone. If we're to be Christian, our goal is not to be a conservative or a liberal, but ultimately we need to become like Christ. And we can't become more like Him and at the same time stay as we are. That's very important. To become like Jesus and to become more and more like Him, we can't stay the same as we are. There must be change in our hearts. What is the very opening words of Jesus in, I think it's Mark's Gospel? Repent, which is another word for reform, change, Change your lives and believe in the good news. And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. If we allow him to change our hearts so that they're now in conformity with him, who is the truth, then we will no longer need the laws. That sounds crazy, I know, but think about it. If we love others as God loves us, we're free to do the things we desire to do. But remember that the first part has to be there. Without that first part, the second part becomes severely flawed. We have to love others as God loves us. In other words, our hearts have to be in conformity with the heart of God. I know someone, this particular individual that I know, he was Catholic. He no longer practices his Catholic faith, but somehow he got connected with another group. And the group somehow convinced him that as long as he proclaims Jesus as his personal Savior, he is saved, and that there's nothing that he can do that can prevent him from being saved. And he lives a life of horrible promiscuity, he justifies his actions that he is saved because Jesus is his Savior. He's omitting the first step. He's not loving as God is loving. God has a plan for us. God has given us a plan, and we need to abide by it and follow it. And we need to internalize it, not make it something just on the surface, but it becomes the fabric of our life. He uses the example here from another example here of Christopher West who wrote that beautiful commentary on the theology of the body. But he's a Catholic author and speaker and he uses this example. I have absolutely no desire to murder my wife. Probably none of us here have that, or husband I should say. I don't lie in bed at night and think to myself, blast those old celibate men in Rome who are they to tell me not to murder my wife? I don't need the law. Thou shalt not murder thy wife, because I have no desire to break it. In this sense, I'm free from the law. 
not free to break it, but free to fulfill it. That's the attitude we're supposed to develop in everything in our lives, you know. I feed my child not because the law says I must feed my child, even though there is a law that says child negligence could get you in big trouble. I feed my child because I love my child. You see how you're free of the law. The law is there, but you're free of it. You're following it, not because it's the law, but because it conforms to the will of God. And that's probably one of those difficult parts of the step that this step has as well, because we have to take that attitude in everything. And that's how we accomplish step three. We invite Christ to change our hearts. And notice what he says there on page 83 in the middle. It takes honest prayer. So obviously praying is very important here. When we take this into prayer, remember prayer is all about talking to God, emptying our hearts out to God, along with the other formula prayers. They're important, but I always say that you need to have a balance in your prayer life. There's a proper place for the rosary, a proper place for the novenas, there's a proper place for all your set routine prayers, but if that's the only extent of your prayer life, then it's missing something very important. And that's just simply talking to God. But don't limit yourself to only talking to God as well. You want to keep it in a balance. And when you do that, you let God know that you desire to do these things, and you want Him to give you the desire to change. Ask Him to conform your heart to the truth. How many of us do that when we pray? Whatever that may be. We might even be scared to do that because sometimes some of the false truths we're holding on to, I don't want to let them go because that's my security blanket in this world. But remember, ultimately, it's all about trusting God. That's the ultimate thing that has to save us in the end is we have to trust God. I sometimes think, you know, it's going to be, judgment's going to be really simple. Here's how it's going to work. This is Father Jim's theology, so it's not gospel truth. You know, we always have pictures of judgment day, you know, we're going to stand there before this huge, giant judge's desk, and <clears throat> there's Jesus the judge or whatever, and the giant book is going to be opened up with all the things that we did in our lives, particularly all those black stain things that we did in our lives, and it's going to be a day of complete trepidation and fear. And I'm not saying we shouldn't fear that, but here's my theory of how it might really be. We're going to die, and when we open our eyes after we die, we're going to see ourselves hanging from a branch on a cliff And a voice below is going to say, it's the voice of God. This is God. Let go. And if our lives have been a steady progress towards trusting God, I'm going to let go because it's very much part of the fabric of my life up to that point I died. And I know God will catch me, and then he'll take me home to heaven. Wouldn't it be nice if that's how easy it is? But that make, we've got to make darn sure that we were building a trust in God in this life and not a trust in the things of this world. Otherwise, there's going to be a hesitancy there as we hang on that poor cliff. And maybe that's what hell is, is that we just remain hanging there, our muscles aching, and we never let go. And we've removed ourselves from God, and that's where we hang for all eternity because we don't trust God. And that's why God gives us this life and in this world to develop a trust in God. So we need to ask God to help us with that. We need to be honest with Him. It won't be easy because our hearts are like cold, hard pieces of steel. We, to bend and shape steel, it's going to hurt a bit. To allow Christ to change our hearts, it will involve suffering, but it's worth the freedom that we will gain. Page 84, he goes into that wonderful, beautiful story of the Exodus. If you've been following along in the office of reading since Lent starts, we're reading the story of the Exodus. 
Because of original sin, we're all slaves to sin. We all have inherited a life sentence. We are doomed to die. However, Jesus broke into the, this broken world and paid that life sentence. He paid our bail. He has the key to the prison. and He's unlocked it and he's opened the door and we're standing there in the prison cell. It's a free gift that we do not deserve our pardon. But when we're enslaved in the things of this world, what are we doing? We're still imprisoned in the prison cell, even though the door is wide open. The voice of God is out there saying, trust me, come out. We still have to come out of that cell. He uses the story of the Exodus. It's the same theme. They're enslaved in Egypt. Moses comes as God's spokesperson. Moses instructs them what they need to do. The blood of the lamb on the doorposts is a symbol of their freedom from slavery. In other words, the door is now wide open. They may leave, and Pharaoh does just that after the firstborn die, after that last and almost horrible plague. And off they go. They actually do get out of the cell for a while, don't they? But they're not long in the desert, and what do they start doing? They don't trust God. After all that they have seen, the ten plagues and how God spared them from those ten plagues, after the great miracle of crossing through the Red Sea, God gives them bread from heaven, the manna, water from the rock, quail in the evening. He's there as a pillar of cloud in the day, leading them, a pillar of fire at night to comfort them, to know that they're not alone, that he's with them. And yet they still complain. And as they complain, what do they want to do? And you hear it over and over and over again, not only in Exodus, it's in the book of Numbers as well. Why did we ever leave Egypt? Why did we ever leave our prison cell? Things were better there. They long for the flesh pots of Egypt. And that's exactly what the evil one wants us to do. He wants us to long. He wants us to long for those things. What do they do at the foot of Mount Sinai? As Moses is up there with God, after they've agreed to live a covenantal living, and the most important pillar of that covenantal living is that the Lord your God is the only God, Him alone. That's the great Shema prayer that they pray as well. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. A pious Jew recites that prayer every day. We say it once a week in our night prayer. I believe it's the, one of the readings of the Compline or night prayer of the church once a week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, Him alone. And what do they do as Moses is up there now to receive in God's glory the tablets of the law? They Moses is missing. He's a little overdue and coming back down. They go into a panic because they're not trusting, and they make a golden calf. And in a way, that's reverting back to their Egyptian ways because what did, one of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped was the cow. Mm -hmm. It's our story as well. So we go now, fast forward this all to Jesus now. He relives, Jesus relives the whole Exodus story. He's doing it, though, kind of in the reverse way. This is what we need to do. On Palm Sunday, which was the tenth day of the first month, notice that if you go back to the Exodus story, this is with the on the tenth day of the first of the month is when Moses gives them the instruction to procure a lamb. Okay? So on Palm Sunday, which is the tenth day of the first month, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem as the Lamb. He is the Lamb that's being procured. This was the same time that the Jews were gathering in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, as they would do every year. And they would purchase a lamb, and then they would observe that lamb for four days. And that's what they did in Exodus. They kept the lamb for four days. You had to inspect the lamb to make sure that it was without blemish and defect. During the four days, the first four days of Holy Week, Jesus is inspected. 
He's inspected by Caiaphas from a distance, Herod, even Pontius Pilate, all the way to Good Friday. And on Good Friday, Pontius Pilate makes the pronouncement, I find no guilt in him. He is a lamb without blemish, in other words. He is the perfect lamb. He's the unblemished lamb. And then at twilight, on the 14th day of that first month, the month of Nisan, the lamb is sacrificed. As Jesus was crucified on that cross, the, the priest in the temple began to cut the throats of all the lambs that were being brought there. They began the sacrifice in the temple. The blood of Jesus is the same of what the blood on the doorpost signified, the blood on the wood of the cross, the doorway to heaven. Our freedom, our key to get out of the cell. It signifies our freedom from the slavery of sin. We are free from the bondage of sin. In other words, we can choose to do otherwise. We have the power through God, through that cross, now to do that. We can't do it by ourselves. Yet just like the Israelites, we Christians, we world, we complain. Sometimes we prefer captivity to freedom because freedom has a price. Ask our founding fathers that, right? Freedom was won in this country at a price. It, but it, it also involves, and here's where freedom in this day and age, 230-some years later, where freedom has been completely misconstrued in this nation. Because freedom doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. That is not what freedom is, and that's what our courts keep upholding. And it's not even consistent, because if it's a Christian who's trying to do something, the courts go against us more often than not. But if it's someone else who wants to remove God from this or that, the courts are always right there to jump on the bandwagon. Freedom has a price. It involves responsibility and it involves change. The Israelites had to leave behind everything that they knew in Egypt. And we must do the same. We must leave behind everything we know as prisoners of sin. Page 86, he goes, how many of you have seen the movie The Truman's Show? A couple of you. If you ever get a chance, watch it. It's a great movie. Just on the level of entertainment, it's fine, but it has a much deeper meaning. I'm not sure if the originators of the movie knew this when they made the movie, but there are there's great overtones in that. It's our story. It's played by, uh, what's his name, Jim Carrey. He plays the, the hero of the movie. It's, a, it's, a, it's a bo about a boy, eventually becomes a man in the movie, whose name is Truman. Now, it's kind of a science fiction type movie, but he's adopted by a big TV producer. I love how they use TV as the image of this as well. See, Truman, who was an unwanted pregnancy, is adopted by a corporation before his birth. He becomes the property of that corporation. And from the moment that he's born, television cameras are on him 24 hours a day. It's one of those, it's like a reality TV show, but it's on, it's got its own channel on cable and everybody else can watch it. And they've built this huge, giant TV studio, a world that he lives in. It's literally an island surrounded by water, and there's this giant dome over it, but it's disguised so it looks like the sky and the clouds and using all the technology. And everybody in that movie is an actor. Truman's mother is an actor. Truman's father is an actor. The people that he grew up with, works with, it's all one giant set of a stage. And it's all done, it's coordinated, choreographed perfectly. So he lives a life that is broadcast live to the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as I said, everybody is an actor in that, except Truman. And everything inside this giant studio is fake, except Truman. He has no idea that his life is being televised. All the cameras are hidden. 
And of course, also what the actors are doing as uh, income for what they're making money, because you know the almighty dollar has always got to be behind it, is they're endorsing products. So one, I remember one scene there in the middle of something, Truman's talking about what are we having for dinner to his wife, who's actually an actor. Um, she all of a sudden pulls out a box or a can of soup or something and does like a little TV commercial there in front of Truman. And they do that throughout the thing. That's how they earn revenue for this show. So everything's fake. And so uh, while he's a child, he questions nothing. And the TV show makes sure that he's kept safe from ever finding out. He, they want to make sure he never wants to leave. That's important, too. He never wants to leave his quote-unquote cell. So they do two things. They show advertisements always showing the dangers of air travel. And anytime they, they every so often will show a horrible plane crash somewhere. So he'll never want to fly anywhere. And in one scene, they stage a fake drowning of his father on the water when he's a young boy. So he's now also afraid of water. He won't cross a bridge. He won't get in a boat. He's afraid of the water. So he's got that boundary around him. So he's going to stay there. But enter, into the story enters the, the love. They try to arrange a love for him, a girlfriend, which eventually becomes his wife in the show. But one of the side characters falls in love with him, and he falls in love with her. And finally, because love must speak the truth, he keeps, they, keep, they keep trying to prevent him from being with her because they know what's happening. They don't want him to be with her. They have already arranged someone else. So finally, she gets him off to a quiet secret on the beach there, and she tries to tell him the truth. But before she can do that, they take her away. Her supposed father comes and drags her away, saying she's crazy, she's got issues and problems and on medication, and, and then she disappears. And then Truman, he can't take that image of her out of his mind. He even takes magazines that he sees and rips out little pieces of people's faces and bodies and reconstructs it like a mosaic, this person that he loved. But she's gone. She went off, I forget where he said he took her, some faraway place, somewhere on the other side of the world. But anyway, so... That love is infectious, though, because love and truth go together if it's real love. And this true love sets Truman now on a quest for truth. Little by little, he starts questioning the reality of this world that he lives in. And uh, as I read there on page 88, I propose to you that in our culture... Because one thing that happens is a stage light accidentally falls down from the giant dome above, and they explain it as uh, something fell out of an airplane, or some, which only would reinforce the fear of flying, right? I propose to you that in our culture, stage lights are falling out of the sky everywhere, our authors say. Something is not right. It's not normal when more children are born out of wedlock than in wedlock. It's not normal when half of marriages end in divorce or separation. It's not normal for so many children to live separated from their biological fathers. It's not normal for 12-year-old children to be obese. It's not normal for a culture to destroy one out of every five children before they're born. It's not normal for TV shows, radio stations, billboards, and magazines to blatantly promote the using and abusing of human beings. We call it entertainment when it's really tragedy. Again, it's those social diseases that we talked about last week. Hedonism, minimalism, individualism. They have slowly spread through our culture. Their seeds were planted a long time ago, very subtly. Watch the old shows like I'm watching. Watch some of the really old movies there as we emerged out of the Depression. You start seeing it planted there already, okay? It doesn't happen overnight, and the devil's very good at that. 
And I've used this example before. I think I used it in the homily a while back. You know, if there's a boiling pot of water and the frog jumps into it, he's going to jump right out because it's hot. But if the frog jumps into a pot of water that's room temperature and the flame is just turned up very low and it's very slowly heating up, before long it's going to be too late, it will be too hot, and he won't be able to jump out. The same is true with our culture as we've been, these seeds were planted, hedonism, minimalism, individualism, they were done so very, very gradually, but now it's, it's picking up at a pace that's it's alarming. It's, it's, it's multiplying in a geometric proportion now. It's out of control. Very interesting scene in the Truman Show. The producer's name, by the, name, by the way, his name, his name is Christoph. Christ off, play on words. He's like the anti-Christ in a sense. He's the opposite of what Christ is. And he's taking callers. You know, sometimes they go from when Truman's sleeping. No one wants to watch him sleeping. So sometimes they switch to the control room and there's Christoph. And he's taking phone calls from the fans. And at one point, one caller asks, why do you think that Truman, notice his name is Truman, but it's really true man as opposed to Christ or Christ off, right? That Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now. And Christoph replies, we accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. It's as simple as that. That's a great philosophical statement right there. Much of what philosophy studies begins right there. We accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. It's as simple as that. You know, Jesus came into this world to give us a different view and a different vision, an alternate world. He's saying, yeah, you're in this world, but you're not of this world once you are baptized in my name. The next caller after that is the girl that got removed from the show. Remember the one that Truman loved? Ever since she was kicked off the show, she's been on a mission to free Truman in the society that watches the show. She begins yelling at Christoph and says, what you've done to Truman is sick. He's a prisoner. Look at what you've done to him. And Christoph again has a very intelligent reply. His character does represent evil. And as we've mentioned, Satan is a genius. He says, if he has if he was absolutely determined to discover the truth, there's no way we could prevent him. I think what really distresses you, caller, is that ultimately Truman prefers the comfort of his cell, as you call it. Better to die in the truth, though, than to live the lie. And the world is lying to us. That's what we believe as Christians. Page 89, he goes on all about the problem with our health care in our country and, of course, with our government now attempting to enforce health care upon us. We're not even going to go into the moral problems that that's creating for us as church, but let's just go at it a few levels from that, just from a practical point of view. I do not, I've never have and I probably never will, Call me unpatriotic, but I don't trust our government. I never have and never will. Because I've seen as I study history that every time our government gets involved in something, more often than not, it makes it worse and ends up spending more of my hard-earned tax-paying money that's wasted in some way. But here's our government now enforcing a government-run plan requiring everyone to have health insurance. Okay? They think that that's going to fix the problem. Every time we try to fix the problem on the surface, when we throw things at it, usually money, we end up getting a bigger problem usually. And then it rears its ugly head and bites us even more. Page 90, however, fixing the problem can't be based on forcing people to do the things and buy things. Notice God never forces us to do anything, does he? It's not certainly not following the, the model of God. The secret to curing our health care system and everything else, as I've already mentioned multiple times, is to win the war within. No system will work if people aren't willing to change. 
I'm still waiting on a president or a leader who has the courage to say, wouldn't it be nice, all our prayers would be answered that in 2016 when our, we have the next presidential election, that they'll find a candidate who is brave enough to say this about all the problems of this country and world. I can't fix this problem. This is not my country. This is not our government's country. This country belongs to you, the American people. I will do all I can to lead by example, restore morality to our government, and reward good choices. But it's only the American people who can choose to end this crisis. You think that president would get elected or presidential candidate? No, we're going to get the barrage of political commercials, which I can't stand, which is another reason why I like watching me TV, which is all the old shows. They don't show any of the political commercials at all. So, um, you know, when we do things that are not good for us, let's just talk on the not spiritual realm, although ultimately it affects us spiritually as well. Let's just talk about eating and our health. We sometimes can make this excuse in this or in many other things. We claim that when I'm sitting on my couch and stuffing my face with potato chips and hot dogs and all that other wonderful processed food, that I'm not really hurting anybody else. Yeah, maybe it's hurting me, I suppose, but it's not hurting anybody else. We're all connected to this together. He uses the example, what happens if suddenly drag racing was made legal through any street in this town? And it might hurt the guy driving the car, and he might say the same thing. Well, it's not hurting anybody else except putting me at risk. It's putting the whole neighborhood at risk. And when we eat unhealthily, we're hurting. I mean, it's causing our health premiums for everybody goes up, right? Everybody's hurt by these poor choices. So the same is true with health insurance. When the majority of people ignore their physical health, there will be more preventable diseases. So our government, in its wisdom, seems to think that they can solve every problem by creating more regulations. Is that the answer? No. Should we hand out citations for people who eat more than their calorie limit per day or find them when they're not exercising? I'm sure no president would ever go on that platform. You know that is not the answer. We have the ability to prevent preventable diseases with the choices we make, so we must do our part to start preventing them. So he uses these very ordinary, common-level things, and then, of course, we can take it to our, our moral lives as well. Page 92, our great nation truly has, been, has the proper foundation. Our founding fathers were very wise. It thrives on freedom. Freedom is based on the ability to choose to do the right thing. It's not about being free from external restraints, keeping us from doing the things we want to do. It's about being free from internal restraints, keeping us from doing the things we should do. We need to return back to our foundation. And the best way to help people is to encourage them to make good internal choices and not force excessive external regulation. The bottom of page 92, everything is focused on people trying to be the best they can be. Top of 93, as soon as individualism, hedonism, and minimalism enter the picture, at any stage, the system fails. That's why this country's failing. What's in it for me? What's the least I can do? If it feels good, do it. But we have to stop pointing our fingers at the problem and start pointing the finger at ourselves. We must stop crying and we must start sweating. We must stop talking and we must start walking. We must stop focusing on changing others and start working on changing ourselves. And changing ourselves is infectious because when people start seeing that we're changing, they want to know why and how, and then they might be inspired to do the same. 
It's easy to compare ourselves with others to justify our behavior. I'm not nearly as bad as that guy, but it only takes one weak link. We know what the weak link does. Even if the rest of the links are strong, one weak link breaks the whole chain apart. Begin focusing within, our author tells us on page 94. And there's where he says, he says, uh, just as hedonism, individualism, and mentalism are contagious, so is holiness. Mother Teresa, hanging on her wall in Calcutta, has this poem. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. Wise words. Unwilling to change, page 95. The bottom line is that we don't want to change. We don't want to let go of this false world in which we are so secure and so comfortable. He uses again the example of the pill, you know, the diet pill. How many shows of advertisements on TV are claiming the pill, this pill will make you lose weight. You just, just as you're sleeping in bed, as you're sitting on that couch, downing those six hot dogs, you will lose weight if you just take... Oh, yeah, first you have to plop all your money down to get the pill, remember that, okay? And if their claim is correct, millions of people have tried this pill. There's a, that means there's, a, there's millions of very gullible people out there, right? I always like to joke with people about the word gullible. Try this on someone sometime. Ask them if they're gullible. No, I'm not gullible. And then a couple minutes later, then say, did you know, I just found this out. This is crazy. For some reason, Noah Webster never put the word gullible in the dictionary. It's not there. You see how many of them will look it up and find it is there. <laughs> gullible, right? We're all gullible. That's one of our weaknesses, though. We'll fall for anything that's easy. We want the shortcut. There's no easy way if we're going to really succeed in the vision of Jesus Christ. We have to take the hard way. It takes blood, it takes sweat, it takes, it takes tears. So what's that? Let's say if they, you know, they, he said that they are developing a pill that might legitimately really work. Let's say they are successful. I'm not sure they have yet. I haven't heard of it yet. Maybe it's hung up in the you know, the government regulations, they have to do 30 years of testing on rats and everything else first, but uh, let's say they finally approve this pill. What's it really going to do? Is it really going to solve our problem? Even if it actually were to work, it's not designed to free people from their struggles with their weight. It's designed to enslave them in their vices, right? So, Word of warning and caution if that pill ever gets out there. Right in the middle of page 96, <clears throat> a sentiment that's becoming more and more common in our culture is, this is just who I am. Stop trying to change me. It's preached as a form of tolerance and acceptance. For example, people will often ask, why can't the Catholic Church just accept people for who they are? The truth of the matter is, is that the Catholic Church accepts everybody, just as God accepts everybody. Come as you are. All are welcome. We sing it in that one hymn. However, you'd better not expect to stay as you are. 
The call of the Gospels over and over again is for radical change in our lives. The essence of Christianity is change. Repent, reform, believe in the good news. Christ is our model, and we are called to become more like him. I think most of us can agree that means we must change. If we're going to become more like Christ, then something has to change. He's not going to change. He's God. God does not change. It's one of his attributes. The person we are today is not our true self. Who are we really? We're the adopted sons and daughters of God. We are heirs to the kingdom of heaven. We are saints in the making. So what do we need? We have lost the concept of what we truly need to do. Overindulgence leads to confusion of needs and wants. We all have legitimate needs. We need to eat. We need clothing. We need transportation so we can get to work. We need a roof over our heads. We have basic needs. There's nothing wrong with we need to have those things. The problem is, as we get more and more things, it leads to overindulgence because we somehow convince ourselves and our body convinces us that we need more of something. He uses the example of Little House on the Prairie. We've all read those books, haven't we? Right? And he uses that one story. Remember where I think they were out in Minnesota, they're living, and finally it looked like they were going to, things were really going to pay off, you know? Not in a really rich, you know, affluent way, but a beautiful wheat crop was growing, and Paul was finally going to be able to sell the wheat and pay off all the debts, and they'd have, lots, they'd have money left over to maybe buy a few nicer things, you know, like a new stove for Ma. And then the grasshopper plague comes and eats the entire crop. And then to make matters worse, then the grasshoppers, after they've devastated everything, they then lay all their eggs in the ground so that the grasshoppers will be back the following year. So there's no point in even planting wheat the following year. And so now Paul has debts. He can't pay. They have no money. He has to walk, what, two, 200 miles to find work. That's not an exaggeration. That's what these people did. This family had no idea whether or not he'd ever come back. And little by little, he earned just enough money to get them by. He returns for Christmas. And those children are so overjoyed because they were able to get a new pair of shoes because the shoes they were wearing were tattered and falling off their feet, and they had to make do with that. They really appreciated getting an apple in their stocking or a shiny copper penny. Now, granted, maybe a penny bought just a little bit more back then than it does now. It's probably like getting a quarter or a 50-cent piece now. But imagine that. How far have we overindulged? As he says there at the bottom of page 97, the fact is that we need very little. The more stuff we have, the more worries we have. It is certainly good to work hard, and sometimes it may be necessary to work long hours, but we must keep things in perspective and not sacrifice emotional needs for material wants. Page 99, why? It's our children's favorite answer, remember? Our question when we were telling them that they had to do something. Take out the garbage, why? You need to go to bed, why? And what's mom and dad's usual response? Because I told you so, and you better do it or else. So what does that really teach the child? To resent authority, not really giving me the right answer. The best way to answer that question, and they will also see to it that your intention there is to control them, to manipulate them when you answer it that way, because I told you so, the best way to answer their questions is with another question our author proposes. So if you tell them to go brush their teeth and they say, why? You don't say, because I told you to. Instead, he proposes you say, what do you think will happen to your teeth if you do not brush them? 
How big and strong do you think you'll grow to be if you eat only junk food all day long? So instead of because I said so, what you're really saying is, and maybe that's what we need to say to people when they question the church, why is it not okay for a couple to live together before marriage and engage in, you know, premarital sex? Because the church says so. You think that's going to work on them? Maybe a better answer is because God wants you to be a saint. Because you were created to be a saint. Not because the church said so. Because God, we have to trust, and there's that trust factor again, knows what he's doing. And he did entrust this church built on the rock of Peter. Albeit it's a church that's flawed through history with many other decisions that were wrong. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the teaching, the official teachings of the church, which people question. And it's getting so bad now that many young couples don't even know it's a sin anymore to have premarital sex. They're not even aware of that. And they'll even say, well, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible because they're unaware of that word. They don't know what the word fornication means. That's there. So I wish they'd maybe retranslate the word in the Bible and said, you know, don't use the word fornication. St. Paul in your epistle say sex before marriage, right? So that should ultimately be the answer to every question, whether it's our kids or we adults who oftentimes are like kids ourselves. Why should I do that? Not because the church told you to, because God wants you to become a saint. So the goal of step three, on the, towards the bottom of page 100, is to winning this war is to rid our lives of everything that isn't helping us to become saints. Again, it isn't easy. The letting go of a lot of things. Some things are always bad and should always be avoided. But we have to really be honest. What are we really dependent upon? Are we dependent upon these things to make us, as we've deceived ourselves into thinking we're happy by those things? So our goal is to free ourselves, to become a saint. He uses examples here again on page 101. You know, there's a whole list of things. Coffee, cigarettes, candy, chocolate, shopping. When our bodies begin demanding certain things, we go into survival mode. And we can't seem to function until we satisfy our cravings. Page 102. He says one of his big crutches was sports. He's one of those sports fanatics who loves to watch sports. I know people who are like that too. Now, I don't know if it's a blessing, but I really could care less about sports. It's just how I'm wired, I guess. I mean, I'll watch a Packer game. I'll get really into it, maybe. But if they're playing the following week and I miss the game, it doesn't really make any difference to me. But there are some people who can't remove themselves from that. Actually, not just the Packers. I know people who work hard all week long. But Saturday and Sunday, that television is on probably more than 12 hours a day, and all that's on is they're watching sports. I mean, the cable helps them with that because you can subscribe to certain channels. I think there's one channel called the Red Zone channel, I think. I'm only aware of this because I heard about it from this person. And all it does is it, it's broadcasting the football games, all the football games they're playing, and it only goes to where they're getting ready to do something important in the game. And after they do it, then it flips to the next game. We're just about important to do something in that game, you know? So it's crazy. It's an addiction. Watching too much sports, that's just one thing. Males, a male's self-esteem is correlated with the success of his favorite sports team. They've done studies on it. How many depressed people go to work on a Monday morning after the Packers lose or even how many don't even get to work on a Monday morning because they're so depressed. <laughs> Anger is another thing we struggle with. You know, the list just goes on and on and on for us. We know what they are. We, we have to, each of us has our own story of our vices. We must become masters of our body. 
The soul must lead the body, not vice versa. The old, the old Roman image, the philosopher, whichever one it was, you know, it's the horse with the reins. Who's leading who? Are, is, are you leading the horse to go where you want to go, or is the horse leading you, running wildly? That's the example. The soul must lead the body, not vice versa. The eternal should lead the temporal. Becoming free involves self-discipline, perseverance, and there it is again, my friends, and lots and lots and lots of prayer. We need the power of the cross. Step four, next week's chapter, will be having a shield to winning the war. And that's a requirement for step three. Free yourself. Once we understand that Christ is necessary for our freedom, we can take action steps. Self-mastery, page 103, speaks about creating good habits in our life, destroying bad habits, gain custody of ourselves, practicing self-discipline. Researchers, here's, a, this, again, I don't know, as more and more as I'm getting older, and I really like getting older, you know that? I really do like getting older. Here's why. Not because my body's creaking and slowing down. I really like getting older. You know why? because I'm beginning to understand the bigger picture a little bit more. A little bit more. I don't have the full picture, and I won't have that full picture until hopefully I'm with God in heaven. But the church in its 2,000 years is so wise as how the Holy Spirit has blessed us in things that we do that so many people today have poo-pooed and said it doesn't really do anything for me anymore. Researchers say it takes approximately 30 to 40 days to make or break a habit. How long is Lent? 30 or 40 days. Actually, it's more than 40 days because <laughs> we don't count the Sundays. It's actually closer to 50 days. And you know, the, one of the things of Lent is it's not just about giving up candy and then go back to eating candy again, which is fine. No, that's a nice practice. But probably more so, more important in my Lenten practice is what vice am I entangled with, enslaved with, and can I use those 30 or 40 days to rid myself of that vice? That's what Lent's really all about, right? Because really what we're supposed to be doing in Lent, we're then supposed to carry it into the rest of our lives so that we benefit from it as well. The littler things that we give up and then take up again, which is nothing wrong with that, is just hopefully teaching our body self-mastery. And maybe we need to do that more frequently as well. So 40 days, you can claim freedom from that thing. Now certain things, obviously, very hard addictions, that's much different. That takes a life. That person is always addicted you know, alcoholism, drug abuse. You know, they, they can get off of it with the strength of God and with good support, but they know that they can never go back to those things ever because our brain is wired that way. Forming good habits is not about following rules. We all know that. We're not supposed to be just blindly following the rules. Page 105, pleasure isn't, pleasure isn't sustainable. It always leaves us wanting more. It doesn't satisfy our hunger. It increases it through self-discipline, perseverance. Happiness can come, not misery. Our world teaches us the opposite. It's telling us that lack of discipline, do what you want to do. If it feels good, do it. Take the easiest way, not perseverance. The world teaches us that gives us happiness. That's a lie. Discipline, self-discipline, perseverance has brought happiness, not misery. So training our bodies through the sword of temperance. Temperance is one of the virtues, isn't it? Is that one of the cardinal virtues, I believe, if I remember them? It's a fancy word. Again, it's like fornication. It's a word that's kind of got lost in our modern vocabulary. Temperance means balance. Balance in our lives. Self-discipline. 
choosing not to have that piece of chocolate cake, even though I could, and it wouldn't probably just that one piece would hurt me. But we need to practice those sorts of things frequently throughout our lives. Probably every day we should have a few things that we could have, but I do without. It's teaching the body it can't have everything it wants. It's the soul. It's the, it's, it's the spiritual saying, we're in control, not you. Again, the body's not evil, but the body, unfortunately, has been marred by the effects of original sin, and we have to be aware of that. Road less traveled. Bottom of page 105 is where summing things up here. When you slip, which we all will, we'll slip. And then what's the temptation? If you slip and fall, give up. Don't. Get back up. Perseverance will win the war. Nothing and nobody can stop you except yourself. Even the devil can't stop you. He's trying. He's doing it all sorts of lies. But only you and me has the freedom to say no or yes. It is a long and difficult road, and it will involve pain. Not always physical pain, but it involves pain, suffering, letting go of the things that we really love. So, mission number three. Last week's mission was what? Fasting and exercising, right? Was that last? No. Oh, this one's fasting and exercise. That's right. What was last week's? <laughs> I can tell I must have not looked, done it. Television. Trying to be a little more temperate, maybe with our watching of television or maybe other things that put a lot of noise in our lives. The devil loves noise. C.S. Lewis, remember the Screw Tape Letters book? Have you ever read it? And it's about this apprentice devil. C.S. Lewis is a genius, too. I mean, should have been Catholic, right? He, is he? Did he become Catholic? Oh, he did. Okay. But uh, in that story, the apprentice is given a task to get this man's soul, to buy this man's, to get this man to give his soul. And he tries everything in his bag of tricks and does, can't succeed. But the devil, the Satan, the prince of all the demons, says, oh, it's, don't do it that way. It's easy. Noise. Clutter. Distraction. The devil uses that. So uh, be mindful. All right, so in mission three, fasting and exercising. Remember a couple lengths ago I did the whole thing on fasting. Maybe some of you remember that. I don't think it was last year, was it? It was two years ago, two lengths ago. Last year we did the Matthew Kelly, uh, one of the other the signs of dynamic Catholics. But the year before that we did fasting. And uh, if you go far enough back somewhere, maybe on the Facebook page, they're probably still out there floating around. You know, everything you put on the Internet is there forever, or at least until the end of the world, right? Or, less, or until the big giant electro... I'm very distrustful of us storing everything on our computers and our money and everything else. You know, all it will take is one huge giant ec electric, electromagnetic pulse, which the Chinese, by the way, are developing that technology far, far ahead of us. And all they have to do is from a satellite, or nature could do it too. The sun could just decide to have one of its every 500 or 1,000 years, which won't kill us, but it will wreck everything that's electronic. Cars won't work because all our cars now are run by computers, aren't they? I mean, that's why I got the 67 Mustang in the garage. That's my getaway car, right, just in case. <laughs> but uh, no, that's something I'm clinging to. Maybe it's something I need to think about getting rid of, right? So... You got to always think about things like that. You're not trusting in God. You can't trust in the things of this world. But anyway, you know, it'll wipe out all the computers, all the hard drives. I suppose if they have some of the stuff stored in some leaden vault somewhere that's got walls 10 feet thick of lead, maybe it'll be saved. But 
You know how prepared we usually are for those sorts of things, right? So I fear that that could happen. I don't know. Hope not. So the 23 and a half hour plan. He's saying this doctor, Mike Evans, in a video says that uh, you can spend 23 and a half hours every day laying down, sitting, sleeping, doing whatever you want. <laughs> no, not everything you want. But 30 minutes a day, good, hard exercise every day. And you will reap healthful benefits from that. So that's a very simple exercise routine, actually. If a treadmill is a little too ambitious, just walking, you know, it's still exercise, right? He even says playing with your kids or your grandkids. That takes a lot of energy, doesn't it? Yeah. So, and then, of course, the fasting aspect as well. So, I think that should do it for this chapter. Next week, we'll move on to having the shield. We'll start looking at the strategic plan here, what we need to be doing as well as knowing, but also doing. Any questions or comments before we move on? In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.